everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our panel on trust and safety and JD Vantage Careers, CU CHIPS, the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, the Trust and Safety Professional Association. My name is Alyssa Aguilar, and I'm a 1L representative for SCU ILSO. ILSO is a student organization for SCU law students that are interested in pursuing careers in internet technology, law, and policy. SCU CHIPS is a student organization for SCU students who are interested in intellectual property and strive to advance and connect women in technology, law, and policy. The ILPF is a professional development organization composed of early career professionals who work across law, technology, and policy. The TSPA is a 501c6 organization supporting the global community of professionals who develop and enforce principles and policies that define acceptable behavior and content online. Generally speaking, JD Advantage careers typically involve roles that do require a legal degree, but do not require acceptance to the bar. Trust and safety typically describes teams that are responsible for writing, implementing and enforcing policies that protect the users of their products and services online. Today's conversation will explore some of the typical JD Advantage roles in trust and safety, explain how these roles differ from traditional counsel roles, and offer some meaningful next steps for candidates pursuing legal adjacent careers in trust and safety. With that, I'd like to introduce our superstar panelists. So excited we have an amazing panel today. So first, we have Chantal Huvela, who spent 14 years at Google running the legal online operations organization, which handled legal takedowns across Google products and third-party data disclosures of Google user data. Chantal is currently a, a program manager for Google Shopping after taking a 2.5 year sabbatical to live in Berlin. Next, we have Donna Fellow, who is a responsible innovation manager at Facebook, where she builds programs to support product teams in anticipating and mitigating potential unintended consequences of the technology they ship early in their development life cycle. Prior to this, Donna focused her career on developing trust and safety policies and optimizing organizational processes. After joining Google in 2014, she led the policy evaluation and oper operationalization for legal content removal requests in the French market, including EU data protection and counterterrorism, and managed the child safety program for legal online operations, where she also became very involved in reviewer wellness and mental health. She then went on to co-develop a program supporting product teams and mitigating abuse-related risks and integrating with proper anti-abuse fighting systems ahead of launch. In subsequent years, she joined the community policy team at Airbnb, collaborating closely with public policy teams on regulatory risks, and then worked on creating processes to better plan for and evaluate the impact of trust and safety policies at Twitter. Although she has now lived in the US for over 15 years, She's a proud native of Togo in West Africa and grew up in France, where she completed a master's in international and humanitarian law. Next, we have Alex Fierst, who is general counsel at Neuralink, a startup developing ultra high bandwidth brain machine interfaces and leads Murmuration Labs, which advises blockchain products on content risk issues. He was previously head of legal and head of trust and safety at Medium, where he led development and enforcement of the platform forms content policies. He serves as a board member of the Responsible Data Foundation, an advisor to the Trust and Safety Professional Association, and a fellow at Stanford University Center for Internet and Society. And last but certainly not least, we have Jeremy Kessel, who is Senior Director of Trust and Safety at yeah. where he is responsible for leading the global teams that handle legal requests for account information and content moderation, in addition to founding and providing ongoing oversight for Twitter's transparency report program. After an initial role as a contractor at Google in 2004, he took a break for tech to attend law school, leading to an internship in Yahoo's legal department in 2008. He joined Twitter in 2009 after graduating from Santa Clara University School of Law, yay, where he focused on technology and intellectual property law. Jeremy is passionate about protecting online free expression and privacy rights. I know that was a lot. Thank you all so much for joining us. With that, we will kick off our panel.
We'd like to remind everyone today that the opinions shared by each of our speakers are their own and do not represent the opinions of their previous or current employers. So to start, uh, the first question is, can each of you speak about what you do in your current roles and your career path leading up to that role? We'll start with Chantal and then we can just kind of work down the list as I just mentioned it. Well, I don't know how, how much time you want me to take because I could speak for the full hour on that. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll, try, I'll try and explain my career path really quickly. Um, you asked firstly what I do right now. So I'm a program manager um, for Google um, in Google Shoppings Org. I hadn't anticipated coming back to Google, to be honest. Um, when I left after 14 and a half years, I was like, bye Google, never see you again. And then somehow I got sucked back in. Um, so uh, I, I went with program management because I wanted to try the product side of the world after working on the, the trust and safety side of the world um, to see sort of how, um, how things were put together um, after working more on the proliferators um, for the first part of my career. So um, that part is really interesting and, and obviously I get to work closely with engineers. Um, not that I didn't before in trust and safety, but even more closely on product cre cre creation and so forth. Um, my career path was kind of an interesting um, uh, accidental uh, thing. And I know people hate that when people have awesome careers that they accidentally went into and not purposely went into, but I just really got crazy lucky. Um, I applied to Google when I, the, the day I, did my first Google query. So I started Google in 2002. Um, I did not do my first Google query in 2002, but it took them like a year and a half for them to finally um, to call me after I submitted my resume. Um, and um, and I, I, uh, I was working in customer service and um, we, the Google started getting these notices of takedown. We got like two or three a day, I would say at that time. And the, and uh, and uh, my boss came to me and was like, hey, you, you deal with like really angry customers on the phone so you can deal with our lawyers too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're like, handle these takedowns. And I would do like one or two a day. Um, and it's kind of funny now, because if you look at, our trans at Google's transparency report, you see that we take down millions a day. So you can see the insane amount of scale that happened in the 14 years and since um, that I started um, working on that. That's sort of how I fell into it in a very short, <laughs> um, I guess I'll go next. Um, so I'm currently on the responsible innovation team at Facebook. Uh, it's a very new team and what we do is um, to partner very closely with product teams really early in the um, development cycle to sort of like anticipate and help them build mitigation strategies around um, uh, potential harms that our products might bring to society and users. And so there's a lot of collaborating very closely with the um, policy, trust and safety, and like all what we call the responsibility team. So all the, the teams operating in that space. Um, and I mean, before that, I, so I graduated from law school in France. Um, I think early on, I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer. I mean, take the bar and sit in a courtroom. <laughs> and so um, I was focusing on international uh, human rights and humanitarian law. Um, and um, somehow life took me to the United States and, um, after working some time as a paralegal in a law firm um, where I was pretty bored, um, I got the opportunity to actually join Chantal's team at Google. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they were look looking for somebody who was speaking French and I had just happened to do that and have done a little bit of legal stuff before. And, um, and yeah, and that's how I sort of like fell into this. Um, and then I, had the great opportunity within that team to do a lot of different things. So working on child safety, working closely with like product teams um, for risk mitigation, um, working on just like a huge variety of, of topics. And that sort of has been the thread of exploration of the rest of my career um, and just like trying different roles to see what else can I learn? How else can I contribute? Um, and that's what's sending me where I am now. All right. Uh, I'll jump in next. Both can hear me. Um, so let's see. So nowadays I'm general. So I, I'm both doing law and, and trust and safety stuff nowadays and have for a while. So quickly. So nowadays I'm general counsel at this company called Neuralink, which um, makes brain implants, which will allow people to connect with phones and other devices. And so 
Um, there's obviously a bunch of bread and butter lawyering that goes with running a startup that's trying to do this. But then also, I think once we get to the point where we have uh, things that can interface directly with your brain, there's going to be all sorts of ethical and other issues around like, you know, if you think social media is awesome now, wait till it's like jacked straight into your frontal cortex and what um, protections might we want to have related to that. So, so that's a lot of my day job um, nowadays and it's still sort of a nascent technology and it'll be a couple of years before I can really do much with it. The other thing I spend a bunch of time on nowadays is, is trying to think is working with blockchain based companies which are starting to have content apps and social apps, um, you know, using uh, you know, distributed ledger technology. Um, and so as people are starting to actually build applications on top of um, blockchain, asking some of the questions around how can we, how can we try to architect um, content moderation and other systems so that we can do something that is more democratically governed, less um, maybe governed by a small number of companies and have systems that allow, um, you know, sort of can fulfill the promise of the decentralized web of being anti-censorship and being resistant to, to government um, efforts to constrain it, but then also um, are more, you know, populist and democratic. So, so, so that's a bunch of my time now. I'll say one or two things quickly about Medium, and then I'll leave off. Um, so, at Medium, I sort of wore both hats of being the lawyer and then also figuring out um, what content moderation and that should work like for a company that was in partly a social network and was and, and has user generated content um, in a way that folks are very familiar with, but then also a company that had aspirations to be sort of long form, high quality, um, very civil, very intellectual and cerebral in nature and had a particular way that it wanted the product to feel to people and how to um, make rules and enforce rules that led the product to have the kind of tonality and the feel that we were trying to achieve. And so that wound up being a very a very fun job because it was sort of like, in, in addition to being legal in nature or enforcement in nature, it was also sort of affirmative in nature and trying to help the product team construct an environment that we thought people were gonna like. And I uh, can talk more about my background later, but essentially I, I went to law school and was an average student and did not expect to be a very good lawyer. And so, have been lucky in that I found my way into a couple of roles where other things that I was better at um, wound up being useful. And I had I had spent my my twenties maybe somewhat questionably doing a PhD in English literature. And actually, it turns out spending my twenties wondering about epistemology and whether truth is possible and things like that was like the perfect preparation for 2020 and all the other work that I would eventually do on the internet. So. Uh, one never knows. So anyway, it's great to be talking with you all today. And I'll leave it there. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, it's a tough, tough crowd to follow here. One of the interesting things about going last is you get to see what thematic things I think we all share and what, what things we don't. One of them being, and we're here to talk kind of around, about careers, is I don't know that any of us plan to be where we are. That seems to be the common thread. And I would, I would definitely say if you take nothing else away from the conversation today, particularly those folks who are in law school, you don't have to have a master plan. That's not important at all. I think just trying to figure out what you want to do and giving it a try and then trying something else is really important. Um, and that's that's kind of sums up my career path, but I'll get into that uh, more in a second. I'm uh, responsible for one of Twitter's uh, trust and safety pillars, and we handle global requests for account information and for content moderation. The nexus being all of the legal issues. So where we have peer teams who deal with the terms of service and all the other peripheral things, our team deals with requests, subpoenas, warrants, those sorts of things when people are trying to obtain user information. And then also uh, all the other issues where our terms of service don't cover uh, but might trigger local law, copyright, trademark, defamation, et cetera. Uh, and I also have the privilege and, and one of my favorite things I've been able to do at Twitter is uh, I was I stood up our transparency report many years ago, and I get to continue to work on that, um, inspired by our colleagues over at Google a, a long, long time ago. So uh, that's great. And I think just going back to that, the career piece, um, I grew up outside of Washington, D.C., and expected and thought about I would be probably going to the government path. Um, luckily, I had an internship on Capitol Hill my freshman summer, and I hated it. And so I had to kind of reassess it through my whole like plan into disarray. Uh, I transferred schools 
and I switched to a history major and uh, I graduated um, without any clue what I was going to do. I ended up taking, uh, I was out in Colorado and I took uh, an opportunity to uh, do a contract at Google in 2004, which got me out to California and opened my eyes to this whole world of uh, complicated, interesting problems uh, and a lot of really smart young people working really hard. Um, and then I realized I didn't really have much to, to offer with my history degree from uh, Boulder. I had a great time in Boulder. I highly recommend visiting Boulder. Um, but I can't say that that degree did much for me. And so I ended up um, going, going to law school and uh, happy to be here um, as someone who graduated from Santa Clara Law. So thank you for having me. And I spent my law school, I think uh, Donna might've mentioned this, like I started law school with the idea that I never wanted to practice law. And so that sort of separated me in a weird way, uh, in a somewhat isolating way from the majority of my peers. Um, but what it allowed me to do is think about different opportunities. So instead of trying to, you know, only get that firm summer job, I took different opportunities. Um, one of which was my first summer, I researched uh, open source licensing. And then my second summer, as everyone was stressing out about firm jobs, um, I went and interned in Yahoo's legal department, which was a wonderful eye-opening experience to see sort of how, what was going on in the real world, right? Uh, and I was in the product council org. And then I graduated law school and I applied to a job on Craigslist. And uh, as I like to say, uh, I, I think, um, and, I, and I know I'm, I'm mindful of the group that I'm here in, but I think this is an important piece. I got the job offer, I think on a Tuesday uh, to work at Twitter. And I found out that Friday that I had not passed the bar that summer. And so I, you know, what did I know? Like the job wasn't contingent on the law degree on the, uh, the bar passage. And so here we are. Um, 11 years later. Awesome. Thank you guys for that intro. I think, Jeremy, you led us kind of into a great dovetail for our next question. For those of you with legal degrees, uh, so Donna, Alex, and Jeremy, do you feel that your legal education adequately prepared you for your current careers? And did you take the bar? Why or why not? Um, we'll start with Alex, and then we'll go to Donna and Jeremy. Sure. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I, I took the bar um, partly because it didn't occur to me not to, and this is, you know, a little while back. And, and, and honestly, probably the main reason was mercantile in nature, which was that I thought I should try to get a job that paid as much as possible in order to pay off my student loans. And I thought that more of those jobs were available, um, at least as a lawyer for a few years. And I also thought I wasn't sure if I was well suited to lawyering, but I should try it at the beginning and sort of see how it goes. And so I, I don't think there was anything more trenchant than that involved. Um, I would say a couple of things maybe about, mainly I practice at startups. And so what I found is that like at Medium where I was both like the, the head lawyer and the head trust and safety person is that I, I was, the process of being careful about which hat I was wearing and making clear to others which hat I was wearing at any given moment was both a good discipline and it taught me a few things. And one of them is that I think that in like sort of when you're at a startup, one of your roles as lawyer is that, yes, you want to be trusted and collaborative and affirmative in the way that you're working with people, but very often your part of your role is to be the risk manager and to be the person who's like worried about the bad things that might happen. And you also are a sort of a source of hard power. And so when the lawyers in the room, one thing that people will naturally do is like look to them to shut things down because that's partly their job is to be like, I'm afraid of a bad thing that will happen. And that's, and, and even if that is not what you perceive what you want your job to be, that's part of what people will look to you for. And then I think the second thing about it is this hard power, which is like, it's often tempting. Like if people are not listening to you or not doing the thing you want them to do, of course, it's tempting to sort of be like, but you have to do it because the law says so. And I am the lawyer, I'm interpreting it, so make it happen, or make it stop happening. And so that is sort of like a, a style of interaction that I think lawyers are socialized into. And it's not necessarily a good thing, but it's a thing that happens. I think in trust and safety land, the types of arguments that you make are much more like for better or worse, they're much more based on persuasion. And they're often based on talking about what is the right thing to do, and they're also talking about like what a particular result will be for the environment that your users and that your consumers are gonna encounter. 
And so those types of arguments, when I would have my trust and safety item, are much more like, is this what we is this the value that we want our product to project? Is this the experience we want our users to have? Are we proud of the fact that this is the notice we're giving, or is this crappy notice? As a lawyer, you wouldn't you might be like, is this sufficient notice, or are we going to be at risk of a major class action lawsuit? In trust and safety land, it's like, is this enough notice that we feel like we've done right by our users, maybe, or something like that? And you take a much different orientation towards it. And I would say like a more humanistic and a more holistic orientation towards what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and there's obviously many other aspects of it, but I, I would say that um, I actually really like that terrain better because at the end of the day, even though it is tempting to sort of like be like, yes, I have like the hard power of the law on my side to say like, do what I want, that the, the, the spaces that were to me were interesting and rewarding and really involved good analysis and good interactions with people were the terrain of thinking about like, how are we gonna improve process? Are we proud of what we're doing? Why are we not doing things in a way that we're, we wanna reproduce? Why are we afraid that this is not gonna scale? And they were much more analytically interesting and they were much more sort of like nuanced on an interpersonal level than the types of legal questions I brought to bear. So there's like lots of fun parts of lawyering too, but I guess I'll say that like these two different approaches, I think really, even though a lot of trust and safety thinking is, is somewhat like legal systematic in nature, I felt like it was a very different part of the brain and engaged and was very glad that I got to do both of them. Um, so for me, I, so I went to law school in, in France, which happens at university. And so it's also free. So I didn't have a lot of pressure to take the bar and work at a law firm. Um, and I studied um, international law and human humanitarian law. So it was all about nonprofits and just trying to to make the world a better place <laughs> in that way, um, and um, and yeah, and so I think what what I um, it, when I came to the U.S., I didn't have any interest in sort of like I thought about it, but I also thought about the financial cost of potentially going back to law school and then like focusing on taking the bar, et cetera, and um, and also I became a mother um, and just had a lot of different priorities. Um, but in terms of like what I'm taking away from my legal education, I think, you know, critical thinking and problem solving, uh, the ability to like look at a lot of different options and sort of like figure out implications and deciding on a, on a this direction to go from there. I think this is a, a skill that we, we all use in our day to day jobs. And so that's also directly relevant to the way we're taught to think um, in law school. Um, and then the second thing for me is that um, since I study humanitarian, um, human rights, uh, international human rights. I think one thing that's very true is the fact that it's not because there is an international standard or even a standard for something that uh, it plays out the same way everywhere. And so sort of like understanding the nuances across like geographies, communities, um, and the tensions that are there, I think has been very helpful as well for me in um, doing my job and thinking about like policies and implications and how they apply and how context is really uh, important. Um, so those are, I think, the two main things that I take with me, um, you know, in my day to day. I think, um, so the question is, do we use our like legal education? Um, I think the short answer for me is yes. Um, in, 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 a, in a literal sense, as I already mentioned, right, I took the bar and it didn't work out. Uh, and I ended up uh, through some serendipitous Craig, Craigslist post uh, at a startup called Twitter. Um, but but really like uh, to be more serious, I was able to my, the first amount of work that I did was copyright work. And that's what one of my primary focuses at Santa Clara Law was. And that's kind of where I ended up. I thought I'd end up anyway. And I think so um, as I joined Twitter, it was right as uh, the company was about a hundred people and trust and safety was 10 people. We had our own engineers and we were like the envy of every other trust and safety group. Um, because we had engineers reporting into uh, my, my boss. Um, but we were just at the point of trying to establish ourselves as a policy org and, and having a clear distinction between what we used to call user services um, and trust and safety. And so I was able to take my legal education, which was in copyright and intellectual property, and you know, kind of immediately get into drafting policies and thinking about both the legal obligations, uh, under the DMCA and those sorts of things. And then also, um, you know, more broadly starting to apply them in the real world, which I think uh, is one of the themes we'll probably kind of keep hearing tonight from people is 
the major differences from the academic world into like applying this these these otherwise you know uh, difficult concepts to real facts fact patterns. Um, the other piece of it for me that's always been helpful is as I moved into what I do, what I've been doing for like the last 10 and a half years, which is dealing with legal requests. Um, I like at the time we had started to see a few subpoenas come in the door and we only had a few lawyers and they had other things to do. They're in-house counsel. It's a hundred people start up. And so, you know, I saw something that I had no background in, but it seemed legal in nature. And I, you know, was this like, had just come out of law school with like some sort of false confidence and um you know volunteered to help and basically that was the beginning of the team that i've had the opportunity to build over this last decade um and that part of it like a huge part of my job is interacting with lawyers and law enforcement and government officials and i think having the ability to in the lawyer case think similarly to them in terms of how they might approach a problem it helps me think through like my job is to take their advice and help my team think about crafting policies and operations based on that advice and to understand sort of like which parts of the risk that they're really you know harping on versus the parts that like they just saying out loud because they're risk averse lawyers um and so i think uh it, it definitely ultimately my my legal education um has been very useful um uh even though i you know as i mentioned before i didn't plan on practicing and i still have no intention to practice law. Awesome, thank you all for that. I think that's everything you guys said is great because that's sort of the point of the panel tonight is you don't necessarily have to take the bar to practice as a typical attorney. There are a lot of other options and roles for you aside from that. And so it's been really cool to see the emergence of that more and more over time and I feel like things are definitely trending in that direction because a legal education is so useful for those of us law students, we're here for a reason. Um, but it's nice to know that that can be used for a lot of other things and not just typical practice. And so to kind of move forward to the topic more specifically of trust and safety, I, and if you guys need a moment or so to think about it, but I just wanted to know what trust and safety means to you. And I want to start with Chantal on this one, and then we can just kind of go through that original order that we had with um, Donna, then Alex, then Jeremy. Trust and safety means to me. Well, I think um, I'm actually gonna um, take um, a second to add a little bit to, even though I have never been to law school before, so I feel a little bit <laughs> like I'm being cheeky uh, to say this, but I do I do really fundamentally know what it takes to do trust and safety, and I have a, a good idea of what you learn in law school. And I think that law school teaches you to think systematically and a lot about what we should do um, and how to structure policies and anticipate what the other side is. And that's exactly what trust and safety is about. Um, it's like creating what the best version of the future should be, um, protecting against abuses of the platform or against um, processes that you put in, uh, you instill, um, and ensure that we think about how we operate with the changing legal and regulatory landscape and how you get a lot of, uh, ahead of the law in, in those ways. And um, law school prepares you for all of that. Um, I think there were a lot of times, um, a few of the panelists talked before about um, what's important in the trust and safety world um, in the job is um, to be persuasive in your arguments. So one of the things that was most, that, that was kind of difficult um, was that because I hadn't been to law school, I had to rely on, on like sort of like the, the um, school of hard knocks, I guess you would say, of learning how to persuade people to, um, to keep content up. And the hardest days that I had were those days where I felt like we would should keep content up and then in the end I wasn't able to persuade the executives to keep content up and it was taken down. And sometimes I wonder if I had gone to law school if I would have been better at doing that. So I do think that law school um, would have better prepared me for for the job that um, that I had in trust and safety. Um, and I think that also sort of answers your question as to what trust and safety means to me. Um, so I felt like I could combine those two answers because you you are sort of the the person who stands for what um, you know not to get like 
egotistical or whatever, but I also thought, I, I often thought we were kind of the moral compass of the company and that it was really important um, work to, um, to instill the, to ensure that the, um, the decisions made um, were based on, um, on uh, the right, uh, the right side of what the, 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 as I mentioned before, the version of the future that you wanted to see, right? So that's what Chimsey means. Um, yeah, I mean, I definitely echoing what Chantal said about like being the, the moral compass and, and just um, sort of like really this idea of like trying to balance, um, you know, various interests and like keep people safe and make sure that, you know, what we, we put out there is actually safe for society. Um, that's, that's what I, I think about a lot. And I think that on a less glamorous note it's also like being the holders of the the least bad outcome <laughs> because it's a lot of that it's a lot of trade-offs that um you have to weigh all the time and um i think it's very rare where you get to a situation that you absolutely have the optimal solution it's really like a combination of like least terrible solutions that we're trying to optimize for the better um so that that's how i perceive it Yeah. Um, so somewhere along the way, I went on Amazon and bought a whole bunch of books on like the philosophy of trust or like the history of trust as a concept. And like, what is this? What is it for? And where does it come from? And one of the one of the my favorite things that I, I read along the way was that the notion that when you have societies where the norms uh, evolve in such a way where you have a lot of trust, it's almost like a bone. It's like free money. Every interaction is better. And every interaction is less costly because you're able to accomplish so many things based on norms and you're able to feel positively about the likely outcome. And a low trust environment is like a tax on everything. Every, every interaction and transaction is harder and less likely to be positive and draining in many other ways. And so I think part of what, what appeals about this, this job and what, what like I found endlessly fascinating about doing this work is that even though the there's an enforcement aspect to it. And that I think, especially in the public mind, like a lot of trust and safety work is really about enforcement and is very police-like in nature or is about taking things down or banning people or about doing things that are very punitive in nature. I think a lot of times when you sit and do the work or when you work with other team members and when you think about policies, like, like Donna was saying, you're really making a very affirmative and positive vision about norms and about how to create a little mini society that works along the lines that, that you feel proud of. And so that is a fascinating thing to try to do. And I think one of the lessons of the past couple of years um, is that wh whatever hard law can accomplish when norms erode, um, bad things happen. And so part of, I think, the exercise of being in trust and safety is about trying to create positive norms of trust in a particularly engineered online environment. And especially when you're doing that with a team that you that you that you love and a product that you're really into, I think it's a sort of like endlessly fascinating, um, uh, like and very positive uh, job in a way that sometimes like the practice of law um, it does not feel like. And I think uh, for me that was like a very satisfying and lucky thing to discover. Um, again, I, I'm enjoying going last because I'm. But you all are saying many of the things I'm thinking and also just learning from each of you. So thank you. Um, I think one of the things we've long talked about uh, in Twitter's trust and safety department is that we think of ourselves and we need to think of ourselves as user advocates, that we're here to balance the company's goals with users' rights. And I think I can't remember if someone said it before, you know, we there is a little bit of like there's one of the kind of common denominators in, in our trust and safety team is. Um, everyone, we have a very diverse group of people, both in, in every sense of the word of diversity. And so we're trying to kind of get as much information and input as we can to make the best decisions we can, because we're trying to also make objective, scalable decisions. And so there's that element of fairness, but really it's about consistency because we're looking at things globally and in every way, and we're dealing with people either internally at the business or externally who have this very singular issue that they want us to deal with in a very you know, singular way. And so it's it's super important for us to use to, to to rely on our ethos, 
and to think about why we're doing stuff, which I think each of our, my fellow panelists have talked about. Um, and I think ultimately, right, it's like trying to, these are all, well, most of these companies are for profit and that's the reality, right? These are corporations that doesn't mean that they are inherently bad or, or good, but it means I think the trust and safety teams take it upon themselves to think really hard about how to add that human element to an otherwise like giant corporate machine that's doing whatever it's doing. Thank you guys for that. That was really insightful and it got a little deep, which I, I really enjoy because it is a really deep conversation that you need to have. For me, a big thing in trust and safety is trying to strike this balance. And I kind of you know caught that notion from everybody. I want to switch over a little bit to what do you guys think uh, the perfect candidate is for trust and safety? What can we as law students and future graduates do to prepare for these roles, JD advantage? And um, if you would maybe like recommend the bar, any, any just tips or tricks you guys have? And then let's start with, we'll start with um, Donna this time and then we'll go to Jeremy. Chantal and Alex for a little switch up. Sure. Um, I think curiosity is one thing that anyone needs to cultivate um, in this role because there's always a lot happening and it's always changing very fast. And so I think being on top of just having that spirit of like research and wanting to understand what happens and not just like know what happens, but actually understand what's beyond the headlines and what's beyond what's being talked about. Um, so I think curiosity and research for me are, are, are two very important skills um, there. And then um, I don't know if you, your question was, also, was it also about like how to find roles or is it more focused on just the, the skills? Um, you can incorporate that as well. Just like I said, any tips and tricks, thoughts you guys have on it for us as students and future graduates? Yeah, sure. Um, so I personally spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. <laughs> and uh, the reason why I do that is just because I check people out and I see what roles they're in and what careers they have and understand their path. And so from there, again, like I go and try to like, you know, research areas of interest and research, you know, things that they're focused on, the studies, et cetera. And so I think that's always giving me a good idea of like, you know, where to go next and where to find roles and what to, you know, where my interest lies. So I think that's, that's, um, that's something that I, I, I cultivate um, in terms of, um, in terms of like how to, how to see like what my next steps are. Um, but in terms of like the space itself, yeah, I, I think like looking beyond sort of like the public conversations that are happening and trying to understand like the issues that underlie that. Um, and also like from the perspective, um, I mean, I also like to always understand like the global perspective of what's happening. And so not just, you know, what you're experiencing in the moment in a particular geography, but also, you know, what does it mean to have, um, what does stress and safety means like across, you know, the world? Like how does, um, you know, Europe feels about privacy, like understand that versus what's happening in the US, um, you know, how, you know, human rights issues play out here versus, you know, in APAC or different regions of the world. So um, again, that, that curiosity of trying to, to look beyond um, your immediate surrounding um, is, is something to, to cultivate. I couldn't, couldn't agree more about curiosity. I think um, when I think of the people who have done well in trust and safety, uh, they're open-minded. Um, empathy is probably, if not the number one trait you need to have, it's like, it's just, I mean, it's probably true for everything in life, but I think uh, and, and resiliency and flexibility. I think we're we're sort of like, again, we're a cost center at these companies. And so we we think we matter and we know we matter and we, we try to have an impact, but we have to think, you know, about the reality again of like a new product comes out, whether we like it or not. And we have to both help think through all the terrible things that can happen and also think about what we're gonna do um, to try to mitigate harm and all these other things. Um, and so I, I also think people, the people who seem to me to be successful in trust and safety, um, and this isn't just trust and safety, but it's, it's definitely part of trust and safety's fabric, I think is people are really passionate and mission-driven 
And so the, the people I've seen who have sort of like haven't made it um, in trust and safety are the ones who come in and just think this is a job. And you can treat it like that, but the work is too hard and it's too complicated to sort of treat it like it's just a transaction. Um, and so the people who kind of commit to like the, the good and the bad, right? Like part of my team's job is to deal with 24 seven emergencies. That's really intense. And we deal with a lot of graphic and difficult situations, but we also every now and again, uh, get the feedback that we've helped save someone's life or prevented a, an attack. Uh, and things like that. And I think that that's not necessarily what you think of when you join like a, you know, kind of whether it's a startup or, or a big, te big tech company and you're kind of excited. In the old days, you get excited about like free lunch and stuff. Uh, so tough, tough news for you all. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, we, the, the, the people working in this stuff really care. Um, and, and then, but you also have to balance again, like that you're out of business. So being sort of open and, and, and flexible, I think is, is important. In terms of like tips or tricks, like uh, I think one of the things that I thought was the most like useful part of my time at Santa Clara was I participated in one of the clinics. I was in the broadband regulatory clinic and it like took us out of this academic setting and into more of like almost a job um, where we're dealing with some problems and dealing with a professor who um, was helping us think about like actual problems like community, you know, uh, broadband and things like that. Uh, and, and we were working on like helping him in his research to do something that was practical. Uh, that, that seemed super useful because I, one of my biggest like critiques of law school is that there isn't a mandatory sort of intern externship kind of piece of it. I feel like it should be, uh, two years of school and maybe a year of like, I don't understand why, uh, medicine is like one of the few things where people get to practice before they get set out into the world. I, I'm grateful that that's what happens with medicine, but I, I frankly think lawyers need that as well. Um, and then kind of the other point, I think LinkedIn, I mean, it goes without saying. Um, uh, and one of the weird things, I'm very biased, but I think people uh, putting aside, you know, your positive or less than positive points of view on Twitter, Twitter is actually can be a really great place to think about career uh, prospects and opportunities, depending on the network you follow or uh, how you use it. So um, I think just trying to take and get experience that isn't the obvious experience is going to help a lot in this in this field. Um, I'm going to double up on a couple of things that Jeremy and Donna said, because I think they're really important. Um, uh, Donna mentioned um, how important it is to have global experience and be able to think um, about cultural norms. So like go out and travel, experience the world, because you're, you're going to be coming in here and applying not just um, American, um, your American cultural norms to um, your decision making, but you have to apply the norms of the regions in which you support. Um, and so if you've never really traveled out in the world, like this is a good excuse to be like, I know I'm totally broke because I just went to law school, but I need to go <laughs> see the world. But you should, if you haven't traveled, travel. Like I really do think it's an important um, a, important aspect of, of the, that global experience that Donna mentioned. Um, I also want to second um, Jeremy about Jeremy's mention of, of the importance of um, surviving in trust and safety. It's kind of a double-edged sword because um, the people who I saw the most, who were the most successful um, in trust and safety were the passionate and mission-driven people. They're also the ones who often got burnt out because sometimes you're so um, passionate and mission-driven that it can be a little bit um, wearing because um, uh, uh, you're not gonna win every battle. Um, and it's, so if you're so like, if you're so like there's a right and there's a wrong and, and sometimes, you know, companies get it wrong and sometimes you get it wrong, um, but you don't realize you get it wrong or whatever it might be. Um, so it's, it's one of those things we're recognizing and having self-awareness of it's important, definitely important to be successful, to have that, that passion and that mission, but also being able to recognize um, that it, that it, that you're not going to win every battle and, and, be, and recognizing that and, and being able to, to look at the, look at the big picture and, uh, and, and not just, um, the day to day, um, in order to like survive that, survive that passion, <laughs> um, and keep it going. Um, good judgment and analytical skills are so key to this. Um, I think in law school, what happens is, uh, and again, I've never been to law school, so I'm speaking <laughs> out of turn. But my sense of law school is that there's it's a lot of academic thinking. 
Um, and in trust and safety, you don't have a lot of time to do academic thinking. It's kind of a fast paced, um, practical application of de decision making. Um, and then you have to make these decisions and you have to make them quick and you have to um, feel comfortable in those decisions so you can go back and defend them later, but not to the point where you can sit in a room and discuss um, all day about whether or not something, um, you know, the, the, the way a policy should be written. Um, sometimes it's just like, okay, let's tweak this policy because now we've come up with this yet another one-off case um, that sort of is outside this policy that we've written. And that's what you, your day-to-day -day is mostly like in trust, in, in trust and safety is there's always, like you think that, that, that everything has been seen before and, and then something else comes up. So you have to tweak that policy once again, but you can't sit there and think academically in it forever. You have to, you have to be more pragmatic and practical. So um, learning how to do that is really important as well. Um, so I, I had put together an adage on this for, you know, after doing it for a couple of years, which was that like, an I ideally to do trust and safety, you have, um, uh, you have the mind of a philosopher, the gut of a police detective, um, and the heart of a kindergarten teacher. And for a long time, that sort of like summed it up for me, because I think there's like, um, there's a analytical aspect that everybody here's, I think, talked about of like, thinking with precision about a policy and how to define certain of the um, policy aspects of what we're talking about and how to think about real world events quickly in a way that's very, very analytical and accurate. There's this sort of inquisitive or investigative aspect to like thinking about a particular case because you're really doing casework and investigating context in a way that, that can be very deep and often very counterintuitive and creative to try to you know look into misinformation or you know, foreign in, in you know attacks or things like that in ways that are that are I think I think highly um so, sort of um uh, forensic in nature. And then I think there's also like an empathetic and caregiving aspect to this job, um, which which is maybe undersold publicly. That I think the people who do this work, as, as Chantal and Donna were saying, like really care a ton and feel a lot of warmth towards users and often interacting in ways that are very um, intense. And so after listening to Jeremy talk, I think maybe I would add like an ER doctor's addiction to adrenaline as, as a fourth quality, because I think there is like an intensity that comes out of this work. And in some ways it's incredible because I feel um, like a lot of warmth towards other people that do this work, you know, even when I meet them as a stranger and I feel tremendously bonded and loyal to my teammates that I've worked with and feel like that we would really do anything for each other in ways that not necessarily people in every career track would do. Um, and so I think people who really want that out of a job get a lot out of this. I agree a thousand percent with Chantal's point that that level of sort of personal passion and intensity and commitment can often lead to burnout and other like difficulties with doing the job in a way that's mentally healthy and sustainable. Um, I would also say an interesting aspect is that there's sort of a high recidivism rate. I think of people who sort of do this work and then like swear, like, oh, I'm, I can't do this anymore. And then like come back, you know, a while later and like have a sort of um, understandable but tortured relationship to the importance of this work in their life. And then also the ways that it's potentially unhealthy for the long term. So to condense all of that, I would also say that I don't know that you need all of those qualities. Probably any one of them will do. Like if you really love the investigative aspect of figuring out like a foreign intelligence operation or a gang or something, that can really do a lot for you. If you really feel like interacting with users and making them feel like justice was done in a way that somebody at this large faceless tech company cared about them, um, that can be super meaningful. And I think, so, so I think actually any one of those things is probably enough, but if you've got two or three, then I think you're like really, suited for this work and maybe might even not be able to avoid it, even if you want to. Um, but I think for a lot of us, when we started doing this job at our various tech companies, we sort of found our way to this because of these reasons. And so in some ways, I think like you should practice all these things, but in other ways, I think this job finds you. Um, and so, and I think you just sort of get that sense if you get exposed to it. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you guys. I do have one final question, and I think this is going to be exceptionally interesting because over the years, we've seen the internet change a lot, society, everything's changed so much. Throw in 2020, that's been 
really exacerbated, I think, um, because we've had to adapt to change so quickly. And so my question is, what do you see as the future for trust and safety? And how do you think your roles might evolve with that? We'll start with Chantal, and then we'll just go back to that original, um, that original plan of having Chantal, then Dona, Alex, and Jeremy. Um, I think um, I think I, I I don't pretend to um, to understand or or know what the future is. I can I can speak to what I want to see the trust and the trust and safety world do um, better at, um, and what I hope maybe this next generation um, of trust and safety um, employees uh, will bring to the table is a, a more effective way to communicate how complicated um, the the decisions are to the average user. I think that you you go to law school and then you start to understand. Um, the arguments on both sides and um, and how complicated this type of decision making is, but I don't think that the average user understands the complexities of it. And I haven't seen, and the average user isn't going to go and look at a transparency report or read that that sort of a thing. We need something that um, that speaks to the average user to help them understand that. Um, and, and I think Twitter has done a pretty decent job of this, Jeremy, by the way, um, that a lot of the others have, you know, by putting those statements on the tweets and so forth for, for, uh, for, for conflict, conflicting information or whatever. But, um, but I, I still think there's a lot more that needs to be done um, in regards to education for the user. So um, uh, maybe this next generation will be better at doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for me, similarly, I, I, I don't think I can say what the future will be, but I can say what I would like to see happen. Um, I think that um, one of the things that I found really interested about, interesting about responsible innovation is this idea of like um, external participation, like participatory processes and like collaboration. And so I would love to see more of that across the industry. We are all trying to solve really, really hard problems that we cannot solve on our own or in our companies individually. And I think like if you look at spaces like child safety, for example, there's a lot of efforts now to just like bring people together and like think of these hard issues together. And I would hope that in the future we move towards those models because we're trying to solve societal issues. So those are not solvable individually. It has to be a society to tackle that. And so this is where I hope the 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 industry goes in the future and which is why I'm excited about TSPA and like spaces like that where you can all come uh, together to talk and collaborate and share ideas. Um, I, th I think I think we're at a moment where potentially maybe this is like Lucy in the football and this always seems like it's about to happen but it's never going to happen which is that I feel like people are actually going to start listening to us but maybe that maybe that's silly. I, and, I, and what I mean in the sense is like lawmakers and lots of folks are, are upset. And one of my hopes has always been that uh, to me, trust and safety developed out of, um, and listen, listening to Chantal talk, it's like things happen to a company, like stuff, bad stuff happens, difficult things happen. And the people with the talent for dealing with those bad things are often put there to enforce or handle them and clean up afterwards. And I think one of the things that might start happening more now is for folks who take this more humanistic or affirmative or policy oriented view of how to build, um, you know, how to build like expressive communities online will be more involved earlier with how to build things. Because I think often just given the way that power and structure works at tech companies, you generally have like the product jocks who are a profit center and do X, Y, and Z and the trust and safety team, which I think of as like the marching band or the, or the drama club or something where it's like we have an ancillary role or a cleanup role or a secondary role related to what is the more like glamorous profit center. And so long as that structure sort of persists, there's gonna be systemic issues on how we do this work in a way that's effective. And it feels to me that increasingly there's more CEOs and there's more heads of product who see that in addition to the sort of like technical and other design aspects of a product, it's important to have sort of humane thinkers involved from the beginning 
not just to do cleanup after there's problems on how people can interact with their, um, you know, with the things they put out there in the world. Now, truthfully, I've been saying this for like five years now, but I feel like if I just keep saying it, maybe that will cause it to happen as if it's true. So I'm just gonna say that's what I think the, the near future holds for, for us all. I wanna live in, in the future that Alex is um, painting. Although what I'm about to say is almost in conflict with that because I think uh, one of the things for me is I think it's these roles and these jobs and we're all biased, uh, who, the people, those of us who work in this, we, we all think this is very important, but I, I do think it's gonna only get more important as, as our worlds continue to blur online and offline. And one of, the, one of the things Chantal said is like one of my, it's been my goal for, since we started our transparency report is like, I want regular people to care about these issues and to try to read, care about reading a transparency report. I don't expect it, but I, I'm gonna keep in the same way as Alex is hoping that trust and safety starts having a real voice. I'm hoping people will understand that their actual lives are happening on the internet and these aren't different places. And so your rights matter in, in all of these forums. And to think about just because it's happening in someone else doesn't, it, it can more likely happen to you online than probably than offline. And so caring about why and what companies do from a moral point of view in terms of protecting your data, what they do in terms of fighting for your, your rights in any given market, um, thinking about you know censorship or other difficult things where um, you know public safety is a legitimate concern, right? There's all sorts of challenging things. I think if we take any you know point of view from what's going on, in, certainly in like the last five years in the world, it's gotten a lot more complicated than it seemed like it was uh, you know prior to that. And so these roles of these companies, I think, are just more important than ever. Um, I also think everyone's touched on this that being the human parts of the company will also, you know, make this both an intriguing place for people, but also um, this is my, my comment sort of not directed at Alex, but at being mindful of the company that the product that you're working on is as all of our companies start to automate more things and rely more on machine learning and artificial intelligence, we need to make sure we're helping product and business people and everyone think about the consequences and build in places to let humans make decisions, right? Even with increasing pressures on all of us. Um, and we're all trying to head off sort of overly, um, you know, repressive regulations to try to allow for speech to continue to be uh, proliferate online. But we need to make human decisions so that there can be human outcomes. And I think we can't train, you know, machines yet to understand that empathetical reasoning of like why something that looks offensive to you doesn't actually in the context that the machine can't understand violate our terms of service or whatever that might be. So for me, this, this space is just going to be bigger and bigger. I don't think trust and safety from my memory was sort of born out of in eBay in like the late nineties. Um, and it wasn't really an industry. It wasn't really a career path until recently. And I'm very happy to see it as such. And hopefully uh, some or all of you will consider this as you uh, leave law school. Awesome. Thank you guys. I think it sounds like a bright future. So I'm really excited. And I really enjoyed how all of you guys really brought back the human aspect to it, because I think sometimes that's easy for users to forget about because it's not something we're constantly thinking about. But I think it's really important. I just appreciate that everybody touched on that. On that, we wish we could keep the conversation going. We are at time. Um, I would love for this to go on forever but being respectful of everybody's time. Um, we do wanna thank again, our fantastic panel. You guys were amazing. These responses were really thought provoking and we were just so grateful and stoked to have you join us and be a part of this conversation. I again, just wanted to shout out and thank SCU also for putting this together, SCU Chips, the ILP Foundry and the TSPA. And again, just, Thank you guys for today. I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thank our audience for joining and we will see you guys all soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.